Good morning, everyone. As people are taking their seats, let me uh, welcome you all. I, I'm Reiner Honecke. I'm uh, with the Delta Science Program. And I have the privilege of uh, welcoming all of you and introducing Supervisor and Council Member Mary Pifo, who has a long history with uh, invasive aquatic weeds. And uh, Mary is also the chair of the Delta Protection Commission. And as a result, she's also sitting on the Delta Stewardship Council. And I'm really glad that you could make it. Uh, Mary gracefully, uh, uh, graciously agreed to uh, provide some welcoming remarks. And uh, so please welcome <laughs> Mary. Thank you, Reiner. Good morning, everybody. It is an honor and a privilege to join all of you as you engage your brains today on this very, very important issue. I will apologize a little early in advance. I have a Board of Supervisors meeting, so I'm going to join you for a few moments, and I'm going to exit stage right, but I uh, encourage all of you to stay through the day and put some good work behind this very, very, again, very important issue. As Reiner stated, I sit on the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors. I'm a founding member of the five Delta County Coalition. I serve as chair of the Delta Protection Commission, and I am also a council member on the Delta Stewardship Council. And maybe, at least to me most importantly, I'm a Delta resident. My family and I have lived in the community of Discovery Bay for over 20 years. Again, it's my honor and privilege to join you and welcome you to today's science symposium on invasive aquatic vegetation in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize the chair of our Delta Stewardship Council, Mr. Randy Fiorini. Randy, if you can indicate yourself. Randy, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Randy has been a tremendous leader on the Stewardship Council and a strong supporter on this very, very important issue, and I really appreciate that, Randy. This symposium was conceived by the Delta Stewardship Council Delta's science program to help the collaborative and now much more comprehensive management efforts by California State Parks, Division of Boating and Waterways, California Department of Food and Ag, and many others who have the up-to-date science information to explore new management and treatment opportunities. The Delta Conservancy and the Delta Stewardship Council have worked very closely with the Invasive Species Coordination Work group under Shakura Azimi Galan's leadership. Shakura, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. There she is. Yes, thank you. <laughs> under Shakura's leadership to make this symposium possible. And a big thank you to the many experts that contributed to the planning efforts for today's event, and many thanks to our expert panel discussion leaders. And most of you know, many thanks to each of you for lending your time and your energy with your attendance here today. We hope it is a valuable day for you. All of us hope that this symposium and future ones like this will contribute to focus prevention, better management, and new policy initiatives based on the best sciences available. For those of us at the local Delta level, the recreation enthusiasts, the nature lovers, the bird watchers, the fishermen, we simply cannot thank you enough for your hard work to fight these invasive species. They're ugly, they're nasty, and well, they're invasive. These invasives have a negative effect on our economy, our quality of life, our water supply, and our ecosystem. Our plan of attack is based on science at the root of success, but the policymakers need to support your efforts wherever and whenever needed. We need to assist you with the appropriate funding, with good policies, and the flexibility for you to do your jobs efficiently and effectively. Our approach needs to not only be collaborative, but steady and consistent. I'd like to thank Ray Carruthers, formerly with the USDA, David Bubenheim of NASA, Dr. Lars Anderson, who you'll hear about later, or hear from later, uh, retired from UC Davis, Lucia Becerra, former, former acting director of Department of Boating and Waterways, and my Delta Stewardship Council predecessor, San Joaquin County Supervisor Larry Rustaller, for their leadership, their passion, and their compassion on this important issue. At different times, these folks have picked up the ball and carried it forward, and it's now up to us to move that ball farther down the field. With your participation and collaboration today, we can make a difference together. And again, thank you for joining us today, and it is now my honor to introduce Ted Grossholtz, a professor here at University of California, Davis, and he will carry on. Ted, welcome. Welcome. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary. So I want to welcome everyone to UC Davis and uh, one of the newest buildings here on campus. Uh, we, but, but in trade-off, what we did is we made sure to clear the air so it's a little bit less smoking than it's been in, uh, in past times. Um, I want to sort of acknowledge that this is a collaborative effort between the University of California, Davis, as well as the Dallas Science Program and the Dallas Stewardship Council and, and the Conservancy. This is, this is really a collaborative effort, and of course, the agenda and this, this workshop was put together, of course, uh, you know, by Shakora and her hard efforts, but really, uh, as well, an interagency, uh, the in in Invasive Species Work Group, which includes many different groups, you know, the Conservancy, uh, Delta Science, uh, Calfish and Wildlife Interagency Ecological Program, Boating and Waterways, DWR, CDFA, et cetera. So there's a lot of people sitting around the table trying to think about where we need to go and what we need to do here. So <clears throat> I want to point out that, of course, this is a one-day conference, and there are a lot of topics. This is a very complex and uh, comprehensive issue, and of course, we couldn't include it all. So we've made some decisions about really what to produce today and what, what to show everyone and what to talk about, and of course, this leaves lots of opportunity for topics for future conferences. But again, so if, if there's something that you think really should have been there today, we probably discussed it. We just, uh, just couldn't include it in, in what we were doing today. Um, so really, our goal today is to really per develop a current understanding, like where we are with aquatic weed management, and uh, and really summarize the research that that we have at the moment, um, but also bring up other elements together. We, we're looking to bring together what we know about sort of information acquisition, sharing, and dissemination. In other words, information technology, how that can be brought to bear uh, on uh, aquatic weed management. And, and how that can facilitate uh, public outreach as well, because it's important to get the public to understand what the issues are and bring them aboard uh, to help support this. And then really, you know, where we need to go next, how we need to move on to the future, so where we are and with, within this area and where we need to go in the future. Um, so today's agenda, I'm gonna go forward with this. Hope we got it, let's see. Page up, page down, let's go page. There you go, page down. Um, I will uh, let the speakers know that, for instance, today I'll just sort of point out a couple things. It's my privilege to make at least one introduction, but as speakers come up, um, we do have this device. Don't use it. Okay, I'll go through a couple. Actually, use your finger and the uh, right here on the on the screen here. Is this that is visible? No. Because if their video is being shown, you can't use this. That won't show up. So there we go. So speakers, please use this. We have uh, microphones in addition. Um, and I, before I uh, introduce and discuss this, I just want to touch on a couple things. I know everyone's worried about this. We have bathrooms over here on the left, if any, anyone needs it, um, as well as uh, the food out front. So we do want to thank uh, our, the university services for all their uh, AV setup has been a wonderful setup. These Delta Science uh, conferences are really, uh, really great from that perspective. We're, we're able to present a lot of information, not only to the audience here, but then online to, to a much wider audience. So thanks for that. Um, today's conference, uh, we're going to cover a number of different topics. Uh, in the morning session, we'll be discussing risk assessment and uh, drivers of plant growth. and. Um, after that, we're going to be looking at new mapping tools and, and ways of surveying uh, aquatic plants in the delta and surrounding areas. Um, we will have a morning break, and then uh, everyone's on their own for the lunch break. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to be discussing um, different approaches, uh, such as adaptive management and citizen science, different ways of, of, of actually acquiring and, and addressing and dealing with, uh, with information and, and the successes and failures of management. So hopefully we're going to be learning a bit about that, in fact, and we, we have uh, Jeff Shard from Florida, so one of the things we'll be doing is trying to uh, use the successes and failures of, of other regions uh, to try to help uh, provide some perspective for what we're doing here. Um, and then last, we'll be discussing some issues about the economics and the expense, you know, you know managing aquatic weeds is, is never cheap, and we're looking for new and effective ways of doing this, and we'll be discussing some of the methods, some of the herbicide approaches, and um, how we can think about the, the cost. We will have a panel discussion, which I think will be uh, really interesting and, and try to help us develop uh, and think about new ways to go forward from here, and uh, uh, that'll be towards the end of the day. So um, 
It is now my privilege to introduce uh, our, the lead scientist of the Delta Science Program, Cliff Dom, who has been in this position for, I'm told, now seven days. So this is his, uh, his weekly an week anniversary for this. So um, anyway, so I will, uh, with no further ado, introduce uh, Cliff. Thanks very much. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, the Delta Science Program is very pleased to be engaged in this effort, and I wanted to specifically acknowledge Maggie Christman from our staff, who was uh, instrumental in getting this together. Um, I'm going to uh, basically first introduce myself briefly. For those, some of you know me, uh, some of you uh, probably don't. Um, yes, I have been the Delta Science Program lead scientist for seven days, but I am the new old lead scientist. <laughs> old, look at me. Um, but old also because I did serve in this role uh, from 2008 to 2012, so I am returning uh, to this position. Um, I am a emeritus faculty member from the University of New Mexico. I just retired uh, after 31 years at the University of New Mexico. Um, my retirement was on July 1st, and my retirement lasted 69 days. Uh, so I am back. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to try to do is provide a little bit of an overview and some thoughts and ideas. Uh, they're not going to be particularly Delta-centric, because I'm not uh, the expert on the Delta that many of you are. But I do have some thoughts and ideas that I thought I'd share with you. And I'm going to share them with you without PowerPoint. Um, my uh, mentors at the Delta Stewardship Council over the years taught me that PowerPoint is not always the best vehicle for science communication. And uh, I learned to present science topics without the help of PowerPoint. And so I'm going to do that again today. Um, so uh, hold on and we'll basically move on and, and talk a little bit about some of the things that I hope will be an introduction to the topic that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I have some familiarity with aquatic macrophytes and also invasive aquatic macrophytes. Uh, sort of three areas have uh, inculcated some of my research relative to these uh, plants. Um, and one of the first is because one of my very dear and very close mentors um, was Robert Wetzel. Uh, Robert Wetzel is a UC Davis graduate. He was one of Charles Goldman's first students, maybe his first student, back in the 60s. Um, and his book, Limnology, is what I use. There are three actually editions, a 75 edition, an 83 edition, and this 2001 edition. It's what I used for the 31 years that I taught limnology. And there's a lot of good information in that book about aquatic macrophytes. In fact, it is one of Bob Wetzel's major research areas aquatic macrophytes, invasive aquatic plants, uh, and carbon cycling would probably be three of the topics he most really was interested in. So for those of you who have not read the chapters on uh, aquatic macrophytes in the Wetzel text, uh, I'd recommend looking at it. The one thing that Bob Wetzel was was encyclopedic. Uh, he basically has 128 pages of references in this book. Uh, so uh, the, the amount of information you can glean from a Wetzel chapter is usually pretty impressive. Bob Wetzel reviewed the very first paper I submitted as a doctoral student, and he identified himself. And in identifying himself, uh, he made that paper be better, and he established what ended up being a long-term relationship. Uh, we were part of an IGERT program together, and over the years I just had a lot of opportunities to work with him, particularly when he was at the University of Alabama uh, before he moved to the University of North Carolina, where he passed away a few years back. So that's one link to the topic today. Uh, a second one is kind of a personal uh, recollection for the first time I was taken to the Delta, when I was the Delta lead scientist the last time. Uh, we had some wonderful tours that were given by various uh, individuals, uh, particularly for people from the U.S. Geological Survey. And I remember uh, I had heard all of this uh, information about the limited primary production of the phytoplankton community in the Delta, that it was a light-limited system, and that there wasn't much primary production in the pelagic zone. 
And what struck me when I got to the delta were these massive uh, areas of aquatic macrophytes that were in many, many regions of the delta. And so when I saw that, it sort of said, this is not a system that is not utilizing these nutrients, at least in some, some fashion. And uh, certainly the, the aquatic invasive weed problem has probably gotten worse. The drought certainly hasn't helped. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that today. But uh, I'm really glad because uh, when I was first here and I was seeing that, I was really actually somewhat surprised by how limited uh, at least the information that I could find on the aquatic macrophyte uh, communities and research on uh, those communities within, within the delta itself. And then finally, I have three doctoral students that are still finishing up. I have a year as an emeritus faculty member to get them through. And one of those three students is actually working specifically on uh, aquatic macrophytes in some, uh, uh, some stream systems in uh, a caldera in New Mexico near Los Alamos National Labs. And I'm just going to highlight a little bit of her research uh, when I give you a, a few little stories that I wanted to, to introduce, because we actually have had sensor networks uh, embedded in some of these systems. And there's some interesting information coming out of her research that I just wanted to highlight briefly. So let me uh, basically uh, step back and, and tell you just kind of there are going to be five little short vignettes uh, that I think will link to uh, the uh, symposium today. And the first one uh, is this uh, is a concept that I think we're going to hear about. I know it's on the conceptual diagram that, that Maggie's been working on. And that's the idea that these plants, these aquatic macrophytes and these invasive aquatic macrophytes, are functioning as ecosystem engineers in the delta. Uh, the concept of an ecosystem engineer is a, a concept that's been around for a few decades. Uh, really, I think initially developed by Moshe Shashak when he was working in, uh, in the Negev Desert of, of Israel. Um, and the ideas, I think, were uh, really pretty uh, much embodied in the, uh, the Jones et al. paper that was published in Oikos in 1994. That paper's been cited more than 3,600 times, one of the most cited ecological papers that ever been written. And basically, you know, the definition of an ecological engineer in that, uh, you know, in that paper is that, that they're keystone species that create, that, that create, significantly modify, maintain, or destroy habitats. Some of the classic examples of ecosystem engineers that have been studied well are the kelp forests on our coastal areas, beaver uh, as, a, uh, as a keystone species in a lot of, uh, of streams. Uh, the initial work by Moshe Shashik was actually on a, on a terrestrial snail that basically was uh, uh, feeding on the algae growing inside the rocks of the Negev Desert. And by doing that, produced a, a lot of material that basically became the basis of the soils, which basically structured the plant community of that desert system. So that's where some of the ori original ideas came. I think the idea resonates and is a good idea uh, that certainly describes the aquatic macrophytes in the delta. And I think in many ways we could certainly think of them as being ecosystem engineers in this system. The second thing I wanted to mention is, is uh, some of Bob Wetzel's work. Uh, Bob Wetzel certainly was very interested in what are the sources of primary production and what happens to that primary production in uh, aquatic ecosystems. That was a major focus of his research. Um, and if you go into his book, into his limnology textbook, uh, it's always been, for me, the, the best source I can find of things like rates of primary production, rates of decomposition, biomass. Um, it's a good source of information. It'd be very interesting to look at some of the other systems that he characterizes and compare that to the information that we have on the delta. Uh, certainly the biomass seems to be very high in the delta. It'd be interesting to see how it compares to other aquatic systems around the world. The third thing I wanted to point out is uh, the interaction between these uh, aquatic systems uh, and these uh, macrophytic communities and uh, the, some of the controls on primary production. And some of those controls clearly are going to be light. They're going to be the hydrodynamics of the system. Um, they're going to be nutrients. And uh, also, I think there's an important role to be played by the, uh, by the inorganic carbon cycle and, and what kinds of inorganic carbon uh, are being utilized by these plants. And one of the, um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out, for those of you, uh, some of you may be aware of it, but uh, there has been some uh, interesting work done by Claudia Feiju, uh, 
and her colleagues in Argentina on Egeria, Brazilian waterweed, in its native habitat. And one of the, um, she's published a couple of papers in the late 90s and early 2000s, and one of the key take home messages of, of that uh, uh, paper, or those two papers, is that ammonium is the preferred nitrogen source for Brazilian waterweed. It grows better and grows faster and achieves higher biomass when you have ammonium as, as, as a nitrogen source. So I think uh, you know, that is certainly some argument for thinking a little bit about what are the sources of nutrients to these plants and do they have preferred forms that they utilize. This is one example for one of the species that's of major concern in the delta. Um, but uh, it would be very interesting to know about some of the other species we're talking about and how many of these species uh, can use either nitrate or ammonium and how many of these species have the ability to constitute nitrate reductase enzyme activity to use nitrate. It may be, that information may be available, I may just simply not know about it, but it seems like a topic that we ought to be considering as it relates to some of these invasive plants in the delta. And then um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is a little bit of the research that we're doing on particularly submerged aquatic macrophytes in New Mexico. This is the doctoral work of my doctoral student, Virginia Thompson. And one of the things uh, that we uh, have noted uh, about these uh, plants, which are prolific and which dominate our system during the growing season, is how much they affect uh, some of the water quality parameters that in situ sons that continuously measure uh, some of the water quality parameters and in situ nutrient um, probes like, for example, the SUNA that can measure nitrate continuously or the cycle P that can continuously measure phosphate in these kinds of systems. Uh, you know, to what extent are these plants then playing a major role in the cycling of, the, of these nutrients? And one of the very interesting things that we've seen is that uh, these systems are uh, considered high quality trout habitat where the plants exist. Uh, but when you put a sond in the water in one of these big beds, it's mostly um, Elodea and Ranunculus are the two species. They're native, not non-native. But when you put a, in a, a sond in those systems and start measuring continuously, uh, things like pH, temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and turbidity, uh, one of the things that you immediately see is tremendous diurnal day-night cycles of a number of these variables, and in particular pH and dissolved oxygen. So the standard in New Mexico, and I suspect it's similar here in California, for dissolved oxygen impairment is 5 milligrams per liter. Based on that, we have impairment every day during the growing season, because at night, usually just before sunrise, the oxygen levels are commonly down around 2 and 3 milligrams per liter. And they go up to values as high as 15 milligrams per liter in the daytime. So these plants can have a major effect on some of the uh, key um, things like dissolved oxygen and pH. pH can vary from 7 at the end of the night to as high as 10 during the daytime. And these are moderately buffered, moderate alkalinity kinds of systems. Has anybody done that kind of measurements in the, uh, in the invasive uh, beds of aquatic macrophytes in the delta? I don't know the answer, but certainly it's something I'd be very interested in knowing more about. And then finally, I wanted to mention uh, that there has been some very interesting research on systems that I think have some significant similarities to the delta uh, by other researchers around the world. And in particular, there's one group that I know uh, my graduate student and I have really felt uh, are leading the charge on really interesting research on these kinds of plants, and that's the Danes. Uh, there's a lot of really good work, mostly by Tina Rees and her colleagues uh, in Denmark. Uh, these are mostly agriculturally affected streams. They're lowland streams. Uh, they have proliferations of large uh, quantities of aquatic macrophytes. Many of them are invasive. And uh, there's a whole series of papers over the last 15 years by these uh, uh, researchers in Denmark that I would uh, strongly recommend uh, taking a look at because I think they are doing some of the most innovative and interesting work. And it includes control uh, because of, of the issues in, in Denmark. So with that, I think I will uh, stop. I want to, again, welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to the symposium. It's a topic that I'm interested in. I certainly am not very knowledgeable about uh, the details of the research here in the California Delta, uh, but uh, I think we're going to have a productive day and I look forward to meeting and talking with many of you.
Thank you. So our uh, next speaker, thanks very much, Cliff, appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is John Madsen from uh, USDA, the ARS service, and uh, I'm going to have to put my glasses on so I can see this. Uh, now I feel really bad that I have a PowerPoint. I, oh well. You know, if I do that, I'm going to hex it. It's not going to work at all. So I'm just going to plunge into this, um, and hopefully I'll use up all my time so that there won't be any questions. Uh, but I've been here about a year and a half. Uh, I don't have all the answers yet, and I doubt I'll have all the answers ever. But I, I'm going to talk about the environmental drivers that, that uh, tend to control the growth of aquatic plants, whether they're emergent plants that are rooted in the sediment, like the bulrush in particular, or uh, sometimes arundo can be in wet places. Usually it's more riparian. Uh, floating leaf plants, whether they're rooted in the bottom or uh, free-floating, like water hyacinth and then submerged plants like the Brazilian waterweed, the Agaria densa. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know how much everybody knew here, so I'm going to range from, from the absolute elementary to really getting into the weeds, but since we're talking about weeds, I figure that's okay. Uh, the zone typically where uh, aquatic plants can grow is called the littoral zone. It's the area that, that light can penetrate to the bottom so you're getting the message that, that light is critical for controlling the distribution and abundance of, of aquatic plants, particularly the submerged plants. Uh, and typically we see the emergent plants growing in the shallowest zone, and then we'll see uh, rooted floating leaf plants. And then we'll see uh, submerged plants uh, growing in the, in the next deeper zone. Obviously, there's some overlap between them. And if you're something like a water hyacinth, the free-floating plant, you can grow wherever you want that's wet. So it, it kind of moves around with the winds and the tides. I think it's important to ask, well, what do plants need? And let's start with your basic uh, terrestrial plant. Plants all need uh, light. They, they convert light energy into, into a stored food like uh, initially sugar and then into starch. They require carbon dioxide as the building block for that conversion, and they utilize a lot of water, okay? In addition, they need small amounts of oxygen. They, they use oxygen for respira cellular respiration, and they need uh, nutrients, and primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, but there are a number of different nutrients that they need to grow. Okay, so that's pretty elementary, right? And there's no reason to think that aquatic plants are that different, okay? They're still uh, vascular plants. They still have roots. They root into the sediment. They have a few uh, differences, but for the most part, they still need light. They still need carbon dioxide. They still require a small amount of oxygen for cellular respiration. They need nutrients. There's nutrients in the water, there's nutrients in the sediment, you know, which is more important, we'll get to later. Uh, however, since the sediments are flooded and they're saturated with water, the sediments tend to build up toxic gases like methane and sulfide that the plants have to deal with. And they have ingenious ways of dealing with that, and we'll get to that uh, at the end. If you're not into the uh, symbology of diagrams, here's, here's a, a text slide that says the same thing, they need light, nutrients. They need water, but if you're an aquatic plant, you probably have all the water you're ever going to need, at least while it's still an aquatic site. Carbon dioxide, oxygen, uh, they need an appropriate temperature range. Uh, they have to deal with those toxic gases I mo mentioned a moment ago. And then lastly, they need a safe place to root. They need a safe home. There's a, a theory from uh, plant ecology, uh, Push, put forward by uh, Philip Grime, uh, and he, he looked at three strategies for where we tend to find uh, plants and the, and the adaptive strategies, life histories that they utilize. Uh, 
And I use this to point out that, that plants can deal with uh, disturbance. They can de deal with fairly intense disturbance. And this tends to develop ruderals or colonizer type plants. They can deal with stress, uh, low light or low nutrients, uh, high salinity, uh, high variations in temperatures, but there's no viable strategy to deal with both high stress and high disturbance, okay? So that's, that's a, often people say, well, why are there no plants in this water body? Well, it's because there's both high stress and, and, and high disturbance, and that's, that's typically why it is. That one's not working, so I'll go to this one. So let's move through some of those categories. Uh, first, let's talk about light, okay? Uh, if you are a floating or an emergent plant, your leaves are up in the air, there's no canopy over you, you're the tallest plant around even if you're only a few inches tall, so you have unimpeded access to light. Uh, you have a readily available water source, something that most terrestrial plants dream of, if they dream at all. They have an atmospheric source of uh, carbon dioxide, so CO2 is all around there, they're bathed in CO2. Life is good. And in fact, these communities are the most productive plant communities within the entire temperate zone. They're, they're certainly as productive as, as uh, crop systems in terms of how much biomass they, they produce. If you're a submerged plant though, life is very different. Aquatic, submerged aquatic plants live between a dry and a dark place, okay? They have very low light levels, and I, I can't take credit for that saying, by the way. I heard that from Mike Smart, who's with, who retired from the Corps of Engineers, and it's such a great saying. They live between a dry and a dark place. And so light availability is, is the most critical uh, aspect of uh, submerged plant growth. Uh, the maximum depth of, of light penetration, which we often measure with the Secchi disk, uh, is, determines um, the maximum depth of, of uh, plant distribution and the relative uh, affinity of different plant species and their adaptations to those light levels will tend to, to segregate different species into zones. Uh, so, if we look at the relationship between secchi disk depth, which is a measure of water transparency, uh, and the maximum depth of plant colonization, there's a very strong relationship across all sorts of different lakes uh, from all over the world. And again, if we look at the distribution of individual species, this is data from Lake George in upstate New York. Uh, Again, the plants, what we see are the dominant plants and we'll, we'll perceive them as zones or bands that follow very strict depth ranges. But those plants will often be mixed in under the canopy across a broader range. So light, again, is very critical, particularly for submersed aquatic plants. That's, that's what's limiting their growth. Uh, of course, if there's a lot of nutrients in this system, uh, it'll grow a lot of algae and that'll tend to shade out submerged plants. Uh, and if there's less nutrients in the water column, that's where you typically will start seeing a lot of submerged aquatic plants grow. What about carbon dioxide? Well, I've already said that that's not a big problem for floating and emergent plants, but carbon dioxide also can be very limiting to submerged uh, plants. They, they prefer to take up dissolved carbon dioxide from the water, but Dissolved CO2 is in a very low concentration in water relative to the air, and it diffuses very slowly through the water. So quite often, the, the rate of availability is what's limiting plant photosynthesis. And because of this, many aquatic plants, not all species, but many species, have the ability to use other forms of dissolved inorganic carbon, and the most prominent of these is, is bicarbonate. Uh, and so they can convert bicarbonate into um, uh, CO2 in their cells for use in photosynthesis. My major professor was Mike Adams. He did this study in Italy. There's no reason why he couldn't have done this study in the United States, but he likes Italy. So he went to Italy and he took water from, from all these lakes across a very broad range of alkalinity of levels of dissolved inorganic carbon, 
and he uh, studied their photosynthesis, and he got this, if you put a line through that, there's a very nice relationship between dissolved inorganic carbon and a photosynthetic rate of this plant, which in this case is Eurasian water milfoil. Okay, now let's move to nutrients. And this is the topic that a lot of people seem to be fixed on, that, that nutrients are the cause for all of our um, uh, weedy problems in the delta. And I'm not gonna say that they're not, uh, they're not part of the matrix of problems. Uh, but while water column nutrients drive the growth of, of phytoplankton, of suspended algae, uh, water column nutrients are not the primary source of, of uh, nutrients for aquatic plants. And I'm waiting for the sticks and stones to start flying and none have come, so I'll keep going. Uh, <clears throat> no shoes. Okay. Uh, if we look, and this is data taken from uh, Wetzel's textbook, because I also am a big fan of, of uh, Dr. Whit Wetzel's tomes. Uh, if we look at nitrogen, um, and the amount of nitrogen in the water column in, in uh, this is in Lake Wingra, is only about five tenths of a percent, whereas the upper 10 centimeters of the sediment w was almost 25 percent of all the nitrogen in the lake, including the, the deep sediment. So there's a huge amount of nitrogen readily available to rooted plants in that upper layer of sediment. Likewise, if we look at phosphorus, and this is just from the littoral zone of Lake Wingra, uh, not the whole lake, but again, the amount in the water column is very small relative to the amount that's in the upper sediment. Notice also that the amount that's in the plants is minuscule, okay? It's very small. That's food for thought. John Barco did a study of, of a number of different uh, submerged aquatic plants over a number of years when he was with the U.S. Army uh, Engineer Research and Development Center, uh, and he looked at all the, the nutrients that are necessary for plant growth and determined that the most important source of nitrogen and phosphorus was from the sediment, not from the water column. So now, now you're all saying, yeah, but how about water hyacinth? So here's water hyacinth. Here it is floating in the water. So obviously the plant, that plant is getting all of its nutrients from the, from the water, right? Because the roots are dangling in the water. That just makes a certain amount of common sense. You know, common sense is dangerous, folks. Okay. It, our, our ruling paradigm, and most of the time it's true, is that and I'll find this, this, this is the water here, and this is the sediment, and this is a band of oxidized sediment right at the top, okay, because I did this in a graph program last night, okay, and this line here is uh, the reducing potential, so this is an oxidized zone here, and this is a highly reducing anoxic zone. And here's our uh, soluble reactive phosphorus. It's very low in the water column. It's low in this oxidized zone, and it becomes very high in the sediment below it. You know, why is that? The thought is that, that, the, that the water, the oxygen in the water makes an oxidized cap on the sediment that blocks the flow of phosphorus and also nitrogen from the sediment up into the water column and helps to keep that water relatively low in nutrients. And so that, that's sort of the ruling paradigm. The problem with ruling paradigms is there's all sorts of exceptions. So one, and I apologize, these, these graphs are probably a little hard to see. That's too bad. Uh, if, if we look at this as a floating plant, this is Brasinia, but it doesn't matter what plant it is. They'll form a dense canopy in the middle of the summer. You can see that in the diagram here. It looks much better in the original journal, but again. Uh, this is a zone of anoxic water under that canopy. If we look at floating leaf plants, there's essentially no oxygen in the water underneath them. We can see that in this graph here. This is dissolved oxygen and depth underneath that dense canopy, 
there's no oxygen. So what's going to happen to the nitrogen and phosphorus in the sediment? It's going to come up into the water column and t be taken up by plants and algae. What about uh, with submerged plants? Well, with submerged plants, we see the same thing. This is actually uh, northern water milfoil and coontail. You see a, a anoxic zone when the plants are growing densely. Here's, here's the anoxia, particularly down near the bottom. And that's going to allow nitrogen and phosphorus to come from the sediment up into the water column. So even if the, there's not a high amount of water, of, of nutrients in the water column, the plants can change their environment, with that term uh, ecological engineer, they can change their environment to encourage the release of nutrients from the sediment. And on top of that, and we just heard about how high the pH can get in water, even in, the, in oxygenated water, when the pH goes above uh, 9, uh, there, there's a mechanism that breaks down that oxygenated cap and, and phosphorus will move from the sediment into the water column. So the plants have other ways of getting nutrients than, than uh, what's already coming in bulk flow uh, in the water column. Uh, okay, I mentioned water as being needed by plants. Aquatic plants obviously have all the water they need until the site becomes terrestrial. The interesting thing is that a lot of aquatic plants have mechanisms to, to overcome short-term disturbance like this. They, can, they have tubers or rhizomes that will sit in the sediment and be dormant until the water comes back on. Uh, I mentioned that plants need oxygen. Uh, uh, wetland plants, uh, aquatic plants have uh, structural mechanisms that allow, allow the flow of oxygen uh, from the atmosphere down to the roots if you're a free-floating free aquatic plant or a, a emergent or floating plant. And then the submerged plants, the oxygen from photosynthesis first goes into these spaces, these lacunar spaces here, and gets stored in the plant for use in respiration. So here's a diagram from, from a Wetland's book on the oxygenation of the rhizosphere, of the oxygen actually coming down into the root zone and being pushed out in, into the area just right around uh, the roots. What about temperature? Temperature is a, is, a ver is a very important factor for the growth of aquatic plants, whether they're submersed, floating, or emergence. There's kind of a rule of thumb in biology that with every 10 degrees centigrade increase in temperature, the metabolic rates double until proteins begin to break down at higher temperatures. And if we look at this data, this is data from uh, an older paper on primary pro productivity of, of water hyacinth. And this is taken um, in the field. And so these are at daily averages across a month for air temperature. And you can see that they very nicely fit this linear regression. Uh, uh, as you increase temperature, you're going to become more and more productive, so that even a s relatively small change in temperature will have a large change in productivity of the plants. Uh, and so when you have a very uh, a droughty season with high temperatures like we've had the past year, and those temperatures continue on into the fall, you're going to have a lot of productivity that you might not normally see. This is a not as great of a diagram. Uh, this is a lab uh, study looking at water temperature across a range from 15 to 25 centigrade. And again, relative growth rate of the of water hyacinth increases across temperature. And that doubling time, which is the amount of time it takes to, to increase, to, to double the amount of biomass, uh, drops with higher temperature. Submerged plants also respond to temperature. This is, in this case, this is uh, photosynthesis and respiration. And as you increase temperatures up to some optimum, uh, the plants will increase their growth rate, increase photosynthesis and respiration. I mentioned uh, the topic of those toxic gases, methane, sulfide, um, CO2 for that matter, being trapped in the sediment. Uh, the, the plants in that, in that sediment require oxygen. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of biomass. Like, like this is, these are uh, the rhizomes of white water lily. And the first time you see something like that, you, you just can't believe how much biomass is under the sediment 
uh, for these floating leaf plants. So these plants have an interesting adaptation. This is a drawing of a flow through system where the, uh, the atmosphere is pulled down through the youngest leaves and, and exhausted through the older leaves. And there's a measurable increase in the amount of methane and sulfide coming out of these older leaves. And this is a process the, pl the plants utilize to, to exhaust those toxic gases. <laughs> kind of an oddity, right? So lastly, these plants need a safe place to root. They, they need to have uh, a, only a moderate amount of, of disturbance like wave action or current flow. Um, um, they need to uh, have, um, you know, a, a moderate amount of stress or less. They need to be safe from herbivores. Uh, so th this is uh, something that's often missed when you look at, well, what do plants need? Uh, water movement is, is, can be very important to plants. Uh, obviously, it's a way for aquatic plants to be dispersed um, with water hyacinth. In this lower picture here, you can see large mats of water hyacinth moving en masse in the delta, um, which is not a sight that you like to see, actually. And then they'll move with the tidal fluctuation. They go out when the tide goes out and come back in when the tide comes in. Um, Flooding can be very important to, uh, to plants as well. It tends, to, sometimes people think of it as resetting the plant community. Water hyacinth is adapted uh, for, for a flood area. It's from the Amazon basin of South America, and it's well adapted to the intense uh, flooding of, of that region, and, and uh, it tends to be what controls its population in a, in a given location, basically continually moving plants downstream. Plants do respond to um, uh, wave energy. This is a study from the Baltic on sago pondweed. High wave energy will tend to reduce the abundance of plants, but, but they can tolerate uh, even mo a moderate amount of wave energy. And the plants will respond to that um, uh, uh, energy, uh, that disturbance, by, by producing more propagules, in this case, uh, sago pondweed tubers. So kind of wrapping this up, um, probably none too soon, what's causing all these plants? You know, it, it, I'm, I'm seeming, seeming to debunk that it's all nutrients, that it's all, you know, even climate change, that it's all uh, the drought. I mean, those are all contributors maybe, but, uh, you know, why is it? And I put the NASA confirms alien invasion for Dave Bubenheim. He'll have to defend that. Uh, here's an example. <laughs> I thought it'd be your shoe, at least. Uh, <clears throat> here's a study from Florida uh, on, on the spread of Melaleuca, which is an invasive wetland tree, for lack of a better description. And, and they mapped out where the, where the Melaleuca was from across time. This is actually from taken out of the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management. It's a long story. And I, I redrew that uh, data uh, in a graph of year after introduction versus per percent infestation. And, and what do we find? That this, this graph follows a, uh, a, a curve that all of us in biology have seen 100 times. It's a sigmoid growth curve. It's typical of what we see with populations. So, this intense amount of vegetation is a population phenomenon. And typically when we have uh, invasions, we have a, a lag phase where the, where the plants appear to be growing slowly, then they go into a phase of very rapid growth and expansion. Uh, that's, you know, that's a mathematical function more than uh, necessarily a biological function. And then they reach their carrying capacity, how much habitat they have available. And you know, if you, if you can manage the plants when they're down here, it's much easier and much less intrusive. But when you're up in this growth phase, these plants are growing faster than you can manage them. Okay? And I think this is a recurring problem in the delta. So we're trying to manage these plants when they're growing very quickly. Uh, water hyacinth has a doubling time of around seven to eight days. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with something uh, 
uh, that's growing that rapidly. So I'm not going to speak for boating and waterways other than to say that, that one way around this is to manage all year long and manage this like you would manage uh, a, a wildfire, which also tends to grow, by the way, along a, a sigmoid growth curve. Here's a, a diagram from my previous workplace. I've got one slide left. Talk about perfect, huh? Yeah, I might get invited back. You never know. Uh, we, um, where was I? Oh yeah, this is Mississippi State University. And that's my office right there. Not the whole building, I just have one office in that building. And this lake here um, is right across the street, so it was a little embarrassing when somebody came by at the end of September and said, hey, what are all the plants in that lake across the street? And my response was, there's a lake across the street? <laughs> so we went over and looked, and this is what we saw right here. That's water lettuce. And presumably, somebody went down to our neighborhood Lowe's and bought themselves a cup full of water lettuce and said, you know, we need something in this pond to make it look pretty. They hadn't put it in in June that we could tell, but here, th these are satellite imagery because I was working for a, an institute that specialized in spatial information. So anyway, here's, here's a little bit of water lettuce there in August 5th, and here's September 17th. There was a gasp there, those of you missed it, and that's the appropriate response. This is what we're having in the Delta, okay? Water hyacinth does the same thing. So there's my contact information. I'm even brave enough to put my cell phone down there, um, but uh, th that's all I had for you today, and I guess I do have some time for questions if you want. Or not? Uh, probably will have to go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I'll make sure to be on camera now. So, uh, see, I have, a, I have a, a head that was designed for radio, so I try to avoid things like this. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, Valerie Cook Fletcher, who's uh, at the uh, CDFW, and um, she's here. Great, and she'll uh, tell us about the CDFW's aquatic plant risk assessment process. So, take it away, Valerie. Uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, which I'm going to assume is almost all of you, um, I'm with the Department of Fish and Wildlife's Invasive Species Program. Um, we're pretty new players um, to invasive plant management in the Delta. Um, recent legislation um, brought us into the management mix, and so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of what the process was like prior to our involvement, what this new process looks like, um, our selection of an assessment tool, and then which species we're assessing for the Division of Boating and Waterways, and we'll go through an example um, assessment that we did for curly leaf pondweed, which they are now treating, and what our determination and review process looks like for those species. So the Division of Boating and Waterways um, has been designated the lead agency for aquatic plant management in the Delta and its tributaries. As we all know, the Delta is a very complex and heavily regulated area. So um, in the past, each individual species that the Division of Boating and Waterways wanted to treat required individual legislation for that species. So in 2013, legislation was introduced um, to shift that process into a collaborative interagency process, which um, worked more along the lines of a bilateral determination that um, was interagency and internal rather than requiring legislation. So with the passage of AB 763, that now becomes Harbors and Navigation Code Section 
Section 64.5 stipulates that um, the Division of Boating and Waterways will consult with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, researchers with the University of California, other members of the scientific research communities, and other state agencies that also have authority over invasive aquatic plants. So through those consultations, they determine which species should be given the highest priority for management, as well as determine best measures for control and eradication where feasible, which may or may not include the release of hippos, capybaras, and manatees in the delta. I put together a PowerPoint specifically so I could put that picture in here, so. <laughs> so once that initial determination is made and they have determined that these species um, should be proposed for management in the Delta. They, um, Division of Boating and Waterways proposes those species to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Then we conduct a risk, a risk assessment in consultation with the Department of Food and Agriculture, the Department of Water Resources, the State Water Resources Control Board, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, and then also the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. AB 763 also designated specific impact factors for consideration in that assessment. Those included um, potential obstruction of navigation and recreational uses of the waterways, environmental damages including the health and stability of fisheries, potential impairment of birds access to the waterways as well as habitats for roosting, foraging, and nesting, deterioration of water quality due to plant decay, harm to native plants and biodiversity, and the harm to, state, to the state's economy, infrastructure, and man-made facilities such as water storage facilities, water conveyances, um, irrigation and pumping facilities. It also required that um, our determination has to specify whether the species has been determined to be an invasive aquatic plant. So for those of you who, like me, are sticklers for the invasive species definition and what that does and does not mean, it's important to note that this section provided a specific definition for invasive aquatic plant, um, which means any aquatic plant or algae species whose proliferation or dominant colonization causes or is likely to cause harm um, to the environment, the economy, or human health. It's important to note that that does not make any distinctions about whether that's a non-native species to the ecosystem. So keep that in mind as we come back to that later. So this went into effect in 2014 and the Department of Fish and Wildlife had to determine which risk assessment model do we use. We wanted to select a model that had high accuracies not only for determining which species were invasive, but also in being able to discriminate which aquatic species were not invasive. So we wanted a tool that had high accuracies for both categories, was widely accepted, and then also incorporated those designated factors that were included in that legislation. So initially we look at the Australian weed risk assessment model, which is pretty widely accepted. It's been tested and used um, in various regions, including the US. There are several modifications that have been used elsewhere. However, the Australian weed risk assessment model um, weights aquatic plants pretty heavily toward invasiveness just due to their inherent characteristics. So it's not well suited at discriminating against, discriminating against those non-invasive aquatic plants. That was originally noticed back in um, 2000 where they ended up actually developing the New Zealand aquatic weed risk assessment model specifically for aquatic plants, but that's not been well tested or fully validated in New Zealand or in other regions. So lucky for us, um, Gordon um, down in Florida, I think Doria Gordon is actually out of UC. Um, she, along with a suite of other folks across the US, um, developed um, a U.S. modification of that New Zealand model. That model uses 36 questions to be answered with um, information provided in the literature um, and other information about um, the species ecology, its competitive ability, dispersal mechanisms, its reproductive capacity and modes, 
the potential for impacts, its resistance to management efforts, and history of invasion elsewhere. The model provides um, guidance on answering each of those questions and then dictates how the scoring um, goes for each of those questions. Um, scoring is numerical and cumulative. So with the development of this model, um, they tested its accuracy in the U.S. by selecting 127 non-native species that had been introduced to the U.S. At a minimum of 30 years prior to their testing. So the suite of species that they selected were across a broad um, range of families and six growth forms. So they had a pretty, um, pretty inclusive um, set for testing the model. So the figure on the left shows the distribution of how those species scored when um, the model was applied. The, um, each of the species were classified prior to testing as either a, a non-invasive species, a minor invader, or a major invader. And so you can see um, from left to right the increase in the cumulative score and how those um, broke out when the model was applied. What they found was if they used a one score threshold of about 40, the model had about 90% accuracy in distinguishing major invaders from non-invaders and, and minor invaders when those were grouped together. But they also tested um, a variety of different thresholds to be able to examine how those different thresholds played out and whether they improved or decreased the accuracy in determining major invaders from minor and non. So they also explored using a two system threshold, um, using 31 as the lower threshold and 39 for the upper threshold, where species that fell between 31 and 39 required additional evaluation to determine whether it fell to the non-invader or the major invader. So after the model was initially tested with the full suite of species, they validated the model using um, 20 separate species, 10 of which were invasive and 10 were non-invasive. They used the thresholds of 31 and 39 and found that using that two system threshold, um, they could um, achieve 100% accuracy where species that received scores of under 31 were considered non-invasive, species between 31 and 39 were to evaluate further, and then species receiving scores of greater than 39 were to be considered invasive. So we selected this assessment model to use for our process, and we employ the 31 and 39 um, threshold system. The Division of Boating and Waterways, um, after their consultation process, delivered to the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, a request for assessment of five species, uh, curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, the suite of water primrose species, coontail, and Carolina fanwort. So here's where that native versus non-native invasive definition comes into play. Coontail is actually a native species but I think that by providing that section specific definition, they strategically were able to include um, potential nuisance native species in that as well, so that we can um, allow them to authorize treatment of native species that are problematic as well. So we're going to walk through a little bit of what the weed risk assessment output looks like um, and some of the questions that are asked within that tool and um, how the scoring and the guidance looks. Um, so here we see um, several of the questions address the environmental tolerances of these species, including um, tolerance for temperature, substrate types, water clarity, salinities, pH and then the impacts of water level fluctuation, flooding and drying. We also answer questions about um, the potential establishment and competitive abilities of the species um, into um, established vegetation versus disturbed areas, 
and then we provide information about um, dispersal mechanisms either within a water body or between water bodies, um, generation time, seedling abilities, and vegetation or vegetative reproduction. So whether or not this species relies more heavily on seeding versus fragmentation, self-fragmentation, And then these questions that are highlighted um, are just to provide um, notice of those designated factors for consideration um, about the environmental impacts, um, impacts to water quality, biodiversity, um, impacts to physical uses, obstruction of navigation, impacts to human health, as well as um, impacts to agriculture. And then we're also able to provide information about resistance to management and um, information about the species history of invasion elsewhere. So for curly leaf pondweed, um, the weed risk, weed, weed risk assessment produced a cumulative score of 66, which is pretty high on that scale. So anything above 39 is what we would consider a major invader. So after populating the assessment, um, we go through and prepare a comprehensive report so that we're able to include any relevant factors that we may have found um, in our literature review that weren't captured within the weed risk assessment itself. We prepare a summary of our findings, um, provide all of our references that we populated the assessment with, and then also the, the assessment output that we just looked at. We then distribute that to the designated agencies and as well as internally um, for consultation to solicit for input on the assessment and the report. We incorporate um, any of the information and the feedback that we receive um, from our colleagues. And then once that goes through the executive approval process, um, that gets returned to the Division of Boating and Waterways and their consulting agencies. And then they, um, if they receive a positive determination that the species is invasive, that's their authorization to proceed with um, management of that species in the Delta as determined by that initial consulting group. So the other species um, that we've been requested to assess, Eurasian water milfoil, um, has a tentative score of 76 right now, so that is another species that um, should be approved soon so that they can proceed with treatment. Um, that's currently in the review process. And I'll point out that that weed risk, weed risk assessment was basically populated with John Madsen's CV. So don't believe him when he says that he doesn't know everything because our output says otherwise. <laughs> um, the water primrose is in the assessment stage right now and then coontail and fan, fanwort um, are up next. So in summary, um, we believe that the new process for approving the species treatment um, gives the Division of Boating and Waterways more flexibility um, and control um, over what they believe should be treated and what they're seeing as issues in the Delta. And it incorporates that important insight from key players from the beginning. Uh, we believe that the um, U.S. Aquatic Weed Risk Assessment is a well-suited tool for the requirements that are outlined in that legislation. Um, it's highly accurate. It's rooted in the literature and objective. Um, it allows for compilation of, of relevant information, not only within the assessment tool itself, but also any other relevant information that we find um, that we think would be useful for the division to be aware of. And the cumulative um, numerical scoring process allows um, for species prioritization. So in the event that um, we all know that resources are limited, so when it comes to triaging which species you have to prioritize, um, that tiered scoring um, comes in handy. So the determination and review process um, is pretty thorough and, and more lengthy than we anticipated. Um, but in the future, you know, we hope to be able to, to have quicker turnaround times to facilitate the division's um, speedy action. So with the risk of letting you out early for a break, I think I'll turn this over to 
questions. Yeah. For someone who's a bit remote here, what is your sense of what length is there? And then subsequently, what you hope to bring that timeline down to for the review approval process? So, populating the assessment tool itself um, with access to the literature, we can have a species done in a few weeks, but it's the, it's the process of writing up that full report while also managing our other workload that takes up the majority of the time. So um, we're hoping to get each species down to within a month for preparing that final report and then from there start soliciting um, for those consultations and input, which Realistically, I think we could have done within another month. Yes. Um, I'm curious if any uh, species have been downgraded. Could you hold on for just a second? What we'd like to do is distribute microphones. I know you can hear, but we want to have this recorded. I'm curious if any uh, invasive species have been downgraded. For the aquatic plants that I listed? Um, just ever, I guess, in history, um, or how often do they need to be reassessed? So this is a brand new process and none of them have been assessed for treatment here so far. Um, initially, only those three species were authorized by legislation to be treated. So they've not had the option of treating any other species and discriminating whether or not they want to choose to treat those or not. I'm just <clears throat> sorry. I'm just wondering if um, you have a, this literature re review. I'm wondering how much it considers the priority of uh, the literature that was developed here versus literature that's sort of more generalized in your in terms of the rating process. Because I was thinking that could that could um, maybe affect the rating that you're getting because you're maybe considering literature from elsewhere more than literature. I mean, as equal to literature that was developed here. When you say here, are you referring to California or North America in general? Well, so the, the majority of these species, there's very, very little literature specific to the Delta. I think we maybe have two citations I can think of that are Delta specific. Santos 2011 is the only one I can think of right now. Um, most of these species have been very problematic in other regions of the U.S. for quite some time, and so we rely on a lot of that work. Um, but prior to doing that assessment, the initial evaluation is, can this species survive in the Delta or not? If they couldn't survive here, they wouldn't be requesting us to assess them. So um, once that preliminary question is answered, we know they can survive here, what are the impacts going to look like? So we don't have um, references that are Delta specific, but um, what we do have is a good enough idea of what the potential looks like here. Well, I'll ask one. Um, there's a, a, pro a process um, being run by uh, CALIPC and Plant Right and Sustainable Conservation for Terrestrial uh, Plant Risk Evaluation. Um, are you coordinated with that? I have not been involved in that. I think that had been in the works quite a while before I came along. But from what I understand, I think that's horticulture specific. Well, I, it's, it's, it's species mm -hmm. that are in trade, which, mm -hmm. you know, which includes some um, aquatic Yes, um, yeah, you know, specific. And so on. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll take a quick break. <laughs>